Hello, welcome to my channel, Library by Anne van Hofstadter. I'm reading my books online so I can share my collection of classic books. Please remember, English is my second language. This channel is dedicated to less fortunate readers who, for whatever reasons, cannot afford to buy a classic book. Before we start, Please tell me if you have an easy access to good books. Do you have a home library? Are you using your city library? Please leave your comments below. Now, let us continue. We are reading Chapter 5 of The Mysterious Affairs, Affair at Styles by Agatha Christie. So, chapter five. Is it, it isn't stricken, it is, is it? Where did you find this? I asked Pearl in a lively curiosity. In the waste paper basket. You recognize the handwriting? Yes, it is Mrs. Ingleturps. But what does it mean? Pearl shrugged his shoulders. I cannot say, but it is suggestive. Suggestive. A wild idea flashed across me. Was it possible that Mrs. Ingleturp's mind was deranged? Had she be, had she come had she some fantastic idea of demoniacal possession? And if that were so, was it not also possible that she might have taken her own life? I was about to expound those theories to Poirot when his own words distracted me. Come, he said, now to examine the coffee cups. My dear Poirot, what on earth is the good of that? Now that we know about the cocoa. Oh la la! The miserable Kokoa, cried Poirot, flippantly. He laughed with an apparent enjoyment, raising his arms to to heaven in a mock despair. In what I could not but consider the worst possible taste. And anyway, I said with increasing coldness, as Mrs. Ingleturp took her coffee upstairs with her, I do not see what you expect to find unless you consider it likely that we shall discover a packet of strychnine on the coffee tray. Pearl was sobered at once. Come, come, my friend, he said, slipping his arm through mine. Ne vous fâchez pas. Allow me to interest myself in my coffee cups and I will respect your cocoa. There. Is it bargain? He was so quaintly humorous that I was forced to laugh and we went together to the drawing room where the coffee cups and tray remained undisturbed as we had left them. Pearl made me a re- Capitulate the scene of the night before, listening very carefully and verifying the position of the various cups. So Mrs. Cavendish stood by the tray and poured out. Yes, then she came across to the window where you sat with Mademoiselle Cynthia. Yes, here are the three cups. The cup on the mantelpiece, half drunk. That would be Mr. Lawrence Cavendish. And on the and on one on the tray? John Cavendish. I saw him put it down there. Good. One, two, three, four, five. But where then is the cup of Mr. Ingleturp? He does not take coffee. Then all are counted for. One moment, my friend. With infinite care, he 
he took a drop or two from the grounds in each cup, sealing them up in a separate test tube, tasting each in turn as he did so. His theoshokmi theo theo underwent a curious change, an expression gathered there that I can only describe as half puzzle and half relief. Bien, he said at last, it is evident. I had an idea. Clearly, I was mistaken. Yes, altogether, I was mistaken. Yet, it is strange, but no matter. And in a characteristic shrug, he dismissed whatever it was that was worrying him from his mind. I could have told him from the beginning that this obsession of his over the coffee was bound to scent a blind alley. But I restrained my tongue, and after all, though he was old, Perro had been a great man in his day. Breakfast is ready, said John Cavendish, among coming in coming in from the hall. You will breakfast with us, Monsieur Perrault? Perrault acquiesced. Observed John already, he was almost restored to his normal self. The shock of the events of the last night and upset him temporarily. But his equable pose, poise soon swung back to the normal. He was a man of a very little imagination, in sharp contrast with his brother, who had perhaps too much. Ever since the early hours of the morning, John had been hard at work, sending telegrams, and one of the first had gone to Evelyn Howard, writing notices for the papers, and generally occupying himself with the melancholy duties that a death entails. May I ask how things are proceeding? He said. Do, you, do your investigations point to my mother having died a natural death, or, or... Must we prepare ourselves for the worst? I think, Mr. Cavendish, said Perrault gravely, that you would do well not to buoy yourself up with any false hopes. Can you tell me the views of the other members of the family? My brother Lawrence is convinced that we are making a fuss over nothing. He says that everything points to its being a simple case of heart failure. Does he? Does he? This is very interesting, very interesting, murmured Perrault softly. And Mrs. Cavendish? A faint cloud passed over John's face. I have not the least idea what my wife's views in the, on the subject matter are. The answer brought momentarily stiffness in its train. John broke the rather awkward silence by saying with a slight effort, I told you, didn't I? That Mrs. That Mr. Ingleturf had returned. Paro bent his head. It's an awkward position for all of us. Of course, one has to treat him as usual, but hang it all. Once courage does rise at sitting down to eat with a possible murderer. Perrault nodded sympathetically. I quite understand. It is a very difficult situation for you, Mr. Cavendish. I would like to ask you one question. Mr. Engelterp's reason for not returning last night was, I believe, that he had forgotten the latch key. Uh, is not that so? Yes, I suppose you are quite sure that the lock key, latch key was forgotten, that he did not take it after all. I have no idea. I never thought of looking. We always keep it in the hall drawer. I'll go and see if there's there now. Perrault held his hand with a faint smile. No, no, Mr. Cavendish, it is too late now. I am certain that you will find it. If Mr. Ingleturp take, did take it, he has had ample time to replace it by now. 
but do you think i think nothing if anyone had chance to look this morning before his return and seen it there it would have been a fallible point in his favor that is all chan looked perplexed do not worry said pearl smoothly i assure you that you need not let it trouble you since you are so kind let us go and have some breakfast everyone was assembled in the dining room under the circumstances we were naturally not a cheerful party the reaction after the shock is always trying and i think we were all suffering from it decorum and good breeding naturally enjoy that our demeanor should be much as usual yet i could not help wondering if this self-control were really a matter of great difficulty there were no red eyes no signs of secretly indulged grief i felt that i was right in my opinion that dorcas was the person most affected by the personal side of the tragedy i pass over alfred engeltorf who acted the bereaved widower widower in a manner that i felt to be distinguishing in its hypocrisy did he know that he that we suspected him i wondered surely he could not be unaware of the fact conceal it as we would did he feel some secret stirring of fear or was the confident that his crime would go unpunished surely the suspicion in the atmosphere must warn him that he was already a marked man but did not only suspect him what about mrs cavendish i watch her as she sat at the end of the table graceful composed enigmatic in a very soft frock with white ruffles at the wrist falling over her slender hands she looked very care very beautiful when she chose however her face could be sphinx like in its inscrutability she was very silent hardly opening her lips and yet in some queer way i felt that the great strength of her personality was dominating us all and little cynthia did she suspect she looked very tired and ill i thought the heaviness and the longer of her manner were very marked i asked her if she were very were feeling ill and she answered frankly yes i've got most beastly headache have another cup of coffee mademoiselle said pearl solicitously it will revive you it is unparalleled for the mild effect he jumped up and took her cup no sugar said cynthia watching him as he picked up a sugar sugar tongs no sugar you abandon it in war time huh no i never take it in coffee sacre murmured poirot to himself as he brought back the replenished cup only i heard him and glancing up curiously at the little man i saw that his face was working with suppressed excitement and his eyes were as green as a cat's he had heard or seen something that affected him strongly but was what was it i do not usually label myself as dense but i must confess that nothing out of the ordinary had attracted my attention in another moment the door opened and dorcas appeared mr wells to see you sir she said to john i remember the name as being that of the lawyer to whom mrs ingleterp had written the night before john rose immediately she showed him into my study then he turned to us my mother's lawyer he explained and in a lower voice he is also coroner you understand perhaps you would like to come with me 
We acquiesced and followed him out of the room. John strode and on ahead, and I took the opportunity of whispering to Perrault. There will be an inquest then. Perrault nodded absently. He seemed observed in thought, so much that my curiosity was aroused. What is it? You are not attending to what I say. Is it true, my friend? I am much worried. Why? Because Mademoiselle Cynthia does not take sugar in her coffee. What? You cannot be serious. But I am most serious. Ah, there is something there that I do not understand. My instinct was right. What instinct? The instinct that led me to insist in examining those coffee cups. Shoot, shoot, no more now. We followed John into his study and he closed the door behind us. Mr. Wells was a pleasant man of middle age with keen eyes and a typical lawyer's mouth. John introduced us both and explained the reason for our presence. You will understand, Wells, he added, that this is all strictly private. We are still hoping that there will turn out to be no need for investigation of any kind. Quite so, quite so, said Mr. Wells soothingly. I wish we could have spared you the pain and the publicity of an inquest. But, of course, it's quite unavoidable in absence of doctor's certificate. Yes, I suppose so. Clever man, Bowerstein, great authority on tox toxicology. I believe. Indeed, said John, with a certain stiffness in his manner. Then he added rather hastily, shall we have to appear as witness? All of us, I mean. You, of course. Ah, uh, uh, Mr. Engelturf? A slight pause ensued before the lawyer went on in his soothing manner. Any other evidence will be simply confirmatory, a mere matter of form. I see. A faint expression of, re of relief swept over John's face. It puzzled me, for I saw no reason for it. If you know of nothing to the contrary, pursued Mr. Wells, I had thought of Friday. That will give us plenty of time for the doctor's report. The postmortem is to take place tonight, I believe. Yes. Then, that arrangement will suit you. Perfectly. I need to tell you, my dear Cavendish, how distressed I am at this point, at this most tragic affair. Can you give us no help in solving it, monsieur? interposed Poirot, speaking for the first time since we had entered the room. I? Yes, we heard that Mrs. Ingleter wrote to you last night. You should have received a letter this morning. I did, but it contains no information. It merely a note asking me to call on her this morning as she wanted my advice in a matter of great importance. She gave you no hint as to what the matter might be? Unfortunately, no. That is a pity, said John. A great pity, agreed Perrault gravely. There was silence. Perrault remained lost in thought for a few minutes. Finally, he turned to the lawyer again. Mr. Wells, there is one thing I should like to ask you. That is, if it's not against professional etiquette. In the event of Mr. Mrs. Engelterp's death, who would inherit her money? The lawyer hesitated a moment and then replied, The knowledge will be public property very soon. So, if Mr. Cambodish does not object, not at all, interpolated John. I do not see any reason why I should not answer your question. By her last will, dated August of last year, 
after various unimportant legacies to servants and etc., she gave her entire fortune to her stepson, Mr. John Cavendish. Was not that, pardon the question, Mr. Cavendish, rather unfair to her other stepson? Mr. Lawrence Cavendish. No, I don't think so. You see, under the terms of their father's will, while John inherited the property, Lawrence, at his stepmother's death, would come into a considerable sum of money. Mrs. Engelthorpe's left her money to her elder stepson, knowing that he would have to keep up styles. It was, to my mind, a very fair and equitable distribution. Peru nodded thoughtfully. I see, but I am right in saying, am I not, that your English law, that will, wa, will, was automatically revoked when Mrs. Ingleton's remarried? Mr. Wells bowed his head. As I was about to proceed, Mr. Monsieur Perrault, that document is now null and void. Ha! Huh, said Perrault. He reflected for a moment and then asked, was Mrs. Engelterps herself aware of that fact? I do not know. She may have been. She was, said John unexpectedly. We were discussing the matter of wills being revoked by marriage only yesterday. Ah, huh. one more question, Mr. Wells. You see, her last will had Mrs. Engelterp then made several former wills? On an average, she made a new will at least once a year, said Mr. Wills in pure to bubbly. She was, given to, she was given to changing her mind as to her testimony disposition. Now benefiting one, now another member of her family. Suppose, question suggested Perro, that unknown to you, she had made a new will in favor of someone who was not in any sense of the world, a member of the family. We will say, Miss Howard, for instance, would you be surprised? Not in the least. Ah, Poro seemed to have exhausted his questions. I drew close to him while John and the lawyer were debating the question of going through Mrs. Engelthorpe's papers. Do you think Mrs. Engelthorpe made a will, leaving all her money to Miss Howard? I asked in a low voice. With some curiosity, Poirot smiled, no. Then why did you ask? Hush. John Cavendish had turned to Poirot. Will you come with us, Monsieur Poirot? We are going through my mother's papers. Mr. Ingleterp is quite willing to leave it entirely to Mr. To Mr. Wells and myself. Which simplifies matters very much, murmured the lawyer, as technically, of course, he was entitled. He did not finish the sentence. We will look through the desk in the boudoir first, explained John, and go up to her bedroom afterwards. She kept her most important papers in a purple dispatch case, which we must look through carefully. Yes, said the lawyer. It is quite impossible that there may be a later will than the one in my possession. There is a later will. It was Perrault who spoke. What? John and the lawyer looked at him startled, or rather pursued my friend imperturbably. There was one. What do you mean, there was one? Where is it now? Burned. Burned? Yes, you see, he took out the charred fragment we had found in the crate in Mrs. Engleton's room and added to the lawyer with a, with a brief explanation of when and where he had found it. But possibly this is an old will. I do not think so. In fact, 
I am almost certain that this was made no earlier than yesterday afternoon. What? Impossible, broke simultaneously from both men. Perot turned to John. If you will allow me to send for your gardener, I will prove it to you. Oh, of course, but I don't see Perot raise his hand. Do as I asked. Afterwards, you shall question as much as you please. Very well. He rang the bell. Dorcas answered it in due course. Dorcas, will you tell Manning to come around and speak to me here? Yes, sir. Dorcas withdrew. We waited in a tense silence. Perrault alone seemed perfectly at ease and dusted a forgotten corner of the bookcase. A clumping of hobnailed boots on the gravel outside proclaimed the approach of money. John looked questioningly at Perrault. The letter nodded. Come inside, Manning, said John. I want to speak to you. Manning slowly and hesitantly threw the French window and stood as near it as he could. He held his cup in his hands, twisting it very carefully around and around. His back was much bent, though he was probably not as old as he looked. But his eyes were sharp and intelligent, and bellowed his slow and rather cautious speech. Manning, said John, this gentleman will put some questions to you, which I want you to answer. Yes, sir, mumbled Manning. Pearl stepped forward briskly. Manning's eyes swept over him with a faint contempt. You were planting a bed of begonias round by the south side of the house yesterday afternoon, were you not, Manning? Yes, sir, me and Willem. And Mrs. Ingleturf came to the window and called you. Did she not? Yes, sir, she did. Tell me in your own words exactly what happened after that. Well, sir, nothing much. She just told Willem to go on his bicycle down to the village and bring back a form of will or such like. I don't know what exactly. She wrote it down for him. Well, when, she, when he did, sir, and what happened next? We went on with the begonia, sir. Did Mrs. Ingleturf call you again? Yes, yes, sir, both me and Willem, she called, and then she made us come right in and sign our names at the bottom of a long paper, under where she'd sign. Did you see anything of what was written about her signature? asked Pearl sharply. No, sir, there was a bit of blotting paper over that part, and you sign where she told you. Yes, sir. First me and then Willem. What did she do with it afterwards? Well, sir, she slipped it into a long envelope and put it inside a sort of purple box. And that was standing on the desk. What time was it when she first called you? About four, I should say, sir. Not earlier? Couldn't it have been about half past three? No, I shouldn't say so, sir. I would be more likely to be a bit after four, not before it. Thank you, Manning. That will do, said Poirot pleasantly. The garner glanced at his master, who nodded, whereupon Manning lifted a finger to his forehead with a low mumble and backed cautiously out of the window. We all look at each other. Good heavens, murmured John. What an extraordinary coincidence. How a coincidence. That my mother should have made a will on the very day of her death. Mr. Wills cleared his throat and remarked dryly, 
Are you so sure it is a coincidence, Cavendish? What do you mean? Your mother, you tell me, had a violent quarrel with someone yesterday afternoon. What do you mean? cried John again. There was a tremor in his voice, and he had gone very pale. In consequence of that quarrel, your mother, very suddenly and hurriedly, makes a new will. The contents of that will, we shall never know. She told no one of its provisions. She told no one of its provisions. This morning, no doubt, she would have consulted me on the subject, but she had no chance. The will disappears, and she takes its secret with her to her grave. Cavendish, I much fear there is no coincidence there. Monsieur Pearl, I am sure you agree with me that the facts are very suggestive. Suggestive or not, interrupted John, we are most grateful to Monsieur Perrault for elucidating the matter. But for him, we should never have known of it, of this will. I suppose I may not ask you, Monsieur, what first led you to speak the fact. Perrault smiled and answered a scribble over old envelope and freshly planted bed of begonias john i think would have pressed his questions further but that moment a, the loud purr of a motor was audible and we are turned to the window as it swept past Evie, cried John, excuse me, Wells, he went hardly out into the hall. Perro looked inquiringly at me. Miss Howard, I explained. Ah, I am glad she had come. There is a woman with a head and heart too. Hastings, though the good God gave her no beauty. I followed John's example and went out into the hall where Miss Howard was endeavoring to extricate herself from the voluminous mass of veils that enveloped her head. As her eyes fell on me, a sudden pang of guilt shot through me. This was the woman who had warned me so earnestly, and to those warning I had, alas, paid no heed. How soon and how contemptuously I had dismissed it for my own for my mind, now that she had been proved justified in so tragic a manner, I felt ashamed. She had known Alfred Engelturf only too well. I wondered whether, if she had remained at Stiles, the, stra the tragedy would have taken place, or would the husband have feared her watchful eyes. I was relieved when she shook me. By the hand with a well remembered painful grip. The eyes that met mine were sad but not reproachful. That she had been crying bitterly and could tell by the redness of her eyelids, but her mother was unchanged from its old blunt roofness. Started the moment I got the war. Just come off night duty. Hire a car. Quickest way to get here. Have you had anything to eat this morning, Effie? Asked John. No. I thought not. Come along. Breakfast not cleared away yet. And they'll make you some fresh tea. He turned to me. Look after her, Hastings, will you? Wells is waiting for me. Oh, here's Monsieur Pearl. He's helping us. You know, Effie? Miss Howard shook hands with Pearl, but glanced suspiciously over her shoulder at John. What do you mean helping us? Helping us to investigate? Nothing to investigate. Have they taken him to prison yet? Taken who to prison? Who? Alfred Engelterps, of course. My dear Evie, do be careful. 
Lawrence is of the opinion that my mother died from heart seizure. More fool, Lawrence, retorted Miss Howard. Of course, Alfred Engeldorf murdered poor Emily, as I always told you he would. My dear Evie, don't shout so. Whatever you may think or suspect, it is better to say as little as possible for the present. The inquest isn't until Friday. Not until fiddlesticks, snort Miss Howard, gave was truly magnificent. You're all of your heads. The man will be out of the country by then. If he's any sense, he won't stay here tamely and wait to be hung. John Cavendish looked at her helplessly. I know what it is, she accused him. You have been listening to the doctors. Never should. What do they know? Nothing at all, or just enough to make them dangerous. I ought to know. My own father was a doctor. The, that little Wilkins is about the greatest fool that even I have ever seen. Heart, say sure. Sort of thing, he would say. Anyone with sense could see that once that her husband had poisoned her. I always said he'd murder her in her bed. Poor soul. Now, he's done it, and all you can do is to murmur silly things about heart seizure and inquest on Friday. You ought to be ashamed of yourself, John Cavendish. What do you want me to do? asked John, unable to have a faint smile. Dash it on, Evie. I can't haul him down to the local police station by the scruff of the neck. Well, you might be. You might do something. Find out how he did it. He's a crafty beggar. Dare say he soaked fly papers. Ask Cook if she's missed any. It occurred to me very forcibly at that moment that to harbor Miss Howard and Alfred Engelturf under the same roof. and keep the peace between them was likely to prove a Herculean task, and I did not envy John. I could see by the expression of his face that he fully appreciated the difficulty of the position. For the moment, he sought refuge in retreat and left the room precipitately. Dorcas brought in fresh tea as she left the room. Pearl came over from the window where he had been standing and sat down facing Miss Howard. Mademoiselle, he said gravely, I want to ask you something. Ask away, said the lady, eyeing him with some disfavor. I want to be able to count upon your help. I'll help you to hang Alfred with pleasure, she replied gruffly, hanging too good for him ought to be drawn and quartered, like in the good old days. We are at once then, said Pearl, for I do want to hang the criminal. Alfred Engeltorf? Him or another? No question of another. Poor Emily was never murdered until he came along. I don't say she wasn't surrounded by sharks, she was, but this was only her purse they were after. Her life was safe enough, but, lo but along comes Alfred Engelturf, and within two months, hey, presto. Believe me, Miss Howard, said Pearl very er earnestly, if Engel Mr. Engelturf is the man, he shall not escape me. On my honor, I will hang him as high as Haman. That's better, said Miss Howard more enthusiastically. But I must ask you to trust me. Now, your help my, may be very valuable to me. I will tell you why. Because in all this house of mourning, yours are the only eyes that have wept. Miss Howard blinked, and a new note crept into the gruffness of her voice. If you mean that I was fond of her, yes, I was. 
You know, Emily was a selfish old woman in her way. She was very generous, but she always wanted a return. She never let people forget what she had done for them. And that, in that way, she missed love. Don't think she ever realized it, though, or felt the lack of it. Hope not. Anyway, I was on a different footing. I took my stand from the first. So many pounds a year I'm worth to you. Well and good, but not a penny piece besides. Not a pair of gloves, nor a theater ticket. She didn't understand, was very offended sometimes. She said I was foolishly proud. It wasn't that, but I couldn't explain. Anyway, I kept my self-respect and so out of the whole bunch. I was the only one who could allow myself to be fond of her. I watched over her. I guarded her from the lot of them. And then a bleep tongue scrundrel comes along. And poof! All my years of devotion go for nothing. Pearl nodded sympathetically. I understand, mademoiselle. I understand all your feel. All you feel. It is most natural. You think that we are lukewarm, that we lack fire and energy. But trust me, it is not so. John stuck his head in at this juncture and invited us both to come to see to come to Mr. Mrs. Ingletorp's room. He and Mr. Wells had finished looking through the desk in the boudoir. As we went upstairs, John looked back to the dining room door and lowered his voice confidentially. Look here, what's going to happen when these two meet? I shook my head helplessly. I told Mary to keep them apart if she can. Will she be able to do so? The Lord only knows. There's one thing. Ingleturp himself won't be too keen on meeting her. You've got the keys still, haven't you, Perot? I asked as we reached the door of the lock room. Taking the keys from Perot, John unlocked it and we all passed in. The lawyer went straight to the desk and John lowered followed him. My mother kept most of her important papers in this dispatch case, I believe, he said. Perot drew out a small bunch of keys. Permit me, I locked it out of the precaution this morning, but it's not locked now. Impossible. See? And John lifted the lid as he spoke. Le tournere, cried Perot, dumbfounded. I, who have both the keys in my pocket. He flung himself upon the case. Suddenly he stiffened. And voila, un affaire. The luck had been forced. What? Perot laid down the case again. But who forced it? Why should they? When? But the door was locked. This ex exclamation burst upon us, disjointedly. Peru answered them categorically, almost mechanically. Who? That is the question. And why? Ah, if I only knew. When? Since I was here an hour ago. As to the door being locked, it is a very ordinary lock. Probably. Any other of the door keys in this passage would fit. We stared at one another blankly. Poirot had walked over to the mantelpiece. He was outwardly calm, but I noticed his hands, which from long force of habit were mechanically straightening, spill vases on the mantel face, were shaking violently. See here? 
it was like this, said at last. There was something in that case, some piece of evidence, slight in perhaps, slight in itself perhaps, but still enough of a clue to connect the murderer with the crime. I was vital to him that it should be destroyed before it was discovered and its significance appreciated. Therefore, he took the risk, great risk of coming in here. Finding the case locked, he was obliged to force it, thus betraying his presence. For him to take that risk, it must have been something of great importance. But what was it? Ah, cried Poirot, with a gesture of anger. That I do not know. The document of some kind, without a doubt, possibly the scrap of paper Dorcas saw in her hand yesterday afternoon. And I, his anger burst forth freely, miserable. Animal that I am. I guess nothing. I have behaved like an imbecile. I should never have left that case here. I should have carried it away with me. Ah, oh, triple pig. And now it is gone. It is destroyed. But is it destroyed? Is there not yet a chance we must leave no stone unturned? He rushed like a madman from the room and followed him as soon as I sufficiently recovered my wits that by the time i had reached the top of the stairs he was out of the sight mary cavendish was standing where the staircase branched staring down into the hall in the direction in which he had disappeared what has happened to your extraordinary little friend mr hastings he just rushed past me like a mad bull it rather upset about something, I, I remarked feebly. I really didn't know how much Poirot would wish me to disclose, as I saw a faint smile gather on Mrs. Cavendish's expressive mouth. I endured, endeavored to try and turn the conversation by saying, They haven't met yet, have they? Who? Mr. Engerturf and Miss Howard. She looked at me in rather a disconcerting manner. Do you think it would be a much disaster if they did meet? Well, don't you? I said, rather taken aback. No. She was smiling in her quiet way. I should, li I should like to see a good flare-up. It would clear the air. At present, we are all thinking so much and saying so little. John doesn't think so, I remarked. He's anxious to keep them apart. Oh, John, something in her tone fired me, and I blurted out. Oh, John's an awfully good sort. She studied me curiously for a minute or two, then said to my great surprise, You are loyal to your friend. I like you for that. Aren't you my friend too? I am a very bad friend. Why do you say that? Because it is true. I am charming to my friends one day and forget all about them the next. I don't know what impelled me, but I was nettled, And I said foolishly and not in the best of taste. Yet, you seem to be invariably charming to Dr. Bowerstein. Instantly, I regretted my words. Her face stiffened. I had the impression of a steel curtain coming down and blotting out the real woman. Without a word, she turned and went swiftly upstairs, whilst I stood like an idiot gapping after her. I was recalled to the other motors by a frightful row going on below. I could hear Pearl shouting and expounding. I was vexed to think that my diplomacy had been in vain. The little man appeared to be taking the whole house into his confidence and proceeding of which I, for one, doubted the wisdom. Once again, I could not help regretting 
that my friend was so prone to lose his head in moments of excitement. I stepped briskly down the stairs. The sight of me calmed Poirot almost immediately. I drew him aside. My dear fellow, I said, is this wise? Surely you don't want the whole house to know of this occurrence. You are actually playing into the criminal's hands. You think so, Hastings? I'm sure of it. Well, well, my friend. I will be guided by you. Good. Although, unfortunately, it is a little too late now. True? He looked so crestfallen and abush that I felt quite sorry, though. I still thought my rebuke a just and a wise one. Well, he said at last, let's go, Manly. Have you, you have finished here? For the moment, yes. You will walk back with me to the village. Willingly. He picked up his little suitcase and we went out through the open window in the drawing room. Cynthia Mordock was just coming in and Poirot stood aside to let her pass. Excuse me, mademoiselle, one minute. Yes, she turned inquiringly. Did you ever make up Mrs. Ingletrom's medicines? Slight flash rose in her face as she answered rather constrainedly, No, only her powders. The flash deepened as Cynthia replied, Oh yes, I did make up some sleeping powders for her once. These? Poirot produced an empty box which had contained powders. She nodded. Can you tell me what they were? Sulfonal? Veronal? No, they were bromide powders. Ah, thank you, mademoiselle. Good morning. As we walked briskly away from the house, I glanced at him once then more than once. I had often before noticed that if anything excited him, his eyes turned green like a cat's, and they're shining like emeralds now. My friend, he broke out at last, I have a little idea. A very strange and probably utterly impossible idea. And yet, it fits in. I shrugged my shoulders. I privately thought that Pearl was rather too much given to these fantastic ideas. In this case, surely the truth was only too plain and apparent. So, that is explanation of the blank label. On the box, I remark. Very simple. As you said, I really wonder what I think of it myself. Pearl did not appear to be listening to me. They have made one more delivery. Laba. He observed jerking his tongue over his shoulder in the direction of Styles. Mr. Wells told me as we were going upstairs. What was it? Lock up in the desk in the boudoir. They found a will of Mrs. Engelthorpe's dated before her marriage, leaving her fortune to Alfred Engelthorpe. It must have been made just at the time they were engaged. I came quite as a surprise to Wills. It came quite as a surprise to Wills and to John Cavendish too. It was written on one of the, those printed will forms and witnessed by two of the servants, not Dorcas. Did Mr. Engelthorpe know of it? He says not. One might take that with a grain of salt, I remark skeptically. All these wills are very confusing. Tell me, how this how did those scribbled words on the envelope help you to discover that a will was made yesterday afternoon? Pearl smiled. Mon ami, have you ever, when writing a letter, been arrested by the fact that you did not know how to spell a certain word? 
yes often i suppose everyone has exactly and have you not in, in such a case tried the word once or twice in the edge of the blotting paper or a spare scrap of paper to see if it looks right well that is what mrs ingleturp did you will notice that the word possessed is spelled first with one s and subsequently with two correctly to make sure she had further tried it in a sentence thus i am possessed now what did that tell me it told me that mrs ingleturp had been writing the word possessed that afternoon and having the fragment of paper found in the great fresh in my mind the possibility of a will a document almost certain to contain the word occurred to me at once this possibility was confirmed by a further circumstance in the general confusion the boudoir had not been swept that morning and near the desk were several traces of brown mold and earth the weather had been perfectly fine for some days and no ordinary boots would have left such a heavy deposit i strolled to the window and saw at once that the begonia beds had been newly planted the mold in the beds were exactly similar to that on the floor of the boudoir and also i learned from you that they had been planted yesterday afternoon i was now sure that one or possibly both of the gardeners for there were two sets of footprints in the bed had entered the boudoir for if mrs ingleturf had merely wished to speak to them he would in all probability have stood at the window and they would not have come into the room at all i was now quite convinced that she had made a fresh will and had called the two gardeners in to witness her signature events proved that i was right in my supposition that was very ingenious i could not help admitting i must confess that the conclusions i drew from these few scribbled words were quite erroneous he smiled you gave too much rein to your imagination imagination is a good servant and a bad master the simplest explanation is always the most likely another point how did you know that the key of the dispatch case had been lost i did not know it it was a guess that turned out to be correct you observe that it had a piece of twisted wire through the handle that suggested to me at once that it had possibly been wrenched off a flimsy key ring now if it had been lost and recovered mrs ingleturp would at once have replaced it on her branch on her bunch but on her bunch i found why was obviously the duplicate key very new and bright which had led me to the hypothesis that somebody else had inserted the original key in the lock of the dispatch case yes i said alfred ingleturf without doubt Poirot looked at me curiously you are very sure of this guilt well naturally every fresh circumstance seems to establish it more clearly on the contrary said perrault quietly there are several points in his favor oh come now yes i see only one and that that he has he was not in the house last night but shoot as you english say you have chosen the one point that to my mind tells against him how is that 
because if Mr. Ingleturks know that his wife would be poisoned last night, he would certainly have arranged to be away from the house. His excuse when not obviously trumped, trumped up one that leaves us two possibilities. Either he knew what was going to happen or he had a reason of his own for his absence. And that reason? I asked skeptically. Poirot shrugged his shoulders. How should I know? This creditable, without a doubt. This Mr. Ingleturf, I would, I should say, is somewhat of a scoundrel, but does not of necessity make him a murderer. I shook my head and convinced. We do not agree, huh? said Poirot. Well, let us leave it. Time will show which of us is right. Now, let us turn to the other aspect of the case. What do you make of the fact that all the doors of the bedroom were bolted on the inside? Well, I considered, one must look at it logically. True. I should put it in this way. The doors were bolted. Our own eyes have told us that. Yet, the presence of the candle grease on the floor and the destruction of the wheel proves that during the night someone entered the room. You agree so far? Perfectly. Put with admirable clearness. Proceed. Well, I said, encourage as a person who entered did not do so by the window nor by the miraculous means. It follows that the door must have been opened from inside by Mrs. Ingleturps herself. That strengthens the conv conviction that the person in question was her husband. She would naturally open the door to her own husband. Poirot shook his head. Why should she? She had bolted the door leading into into his room a most unusual proceeding on her part she had a most violent quarrel with him that very afternoon no he was the last person she would admit but you agree with me that the door must have been opened by mrs ingleter herself there is another possibility she may have forgotten to bolt the door into the passage when she went to bed and have got up later towards the morning and bolted it then. Pero, is that seriously your opinion? No, I do not say it is so, but it might be. Now, to turn to another feature, what do you make of the scrap of conversation you overheard between Mrs. Cavendish and her mother-in-law? I had forgotten that, I said thoughtfully. That is an as enigmatical as ever. It seems incredible that a woman like Mrs. Cavendish, proud and reticent to the last degree, should interfere so violently in what was certainly not her affair. Precisely. I, it was an astonishing thing for a woman of her breeding to do. It is certainly curious, I agreed. Still, it is unimportant and need not to be taken into account. A grand burst from Poirot. What have I always told you? Everything must be taken into account. If the fact will not fit the theory, let the theory go. Well, we shall see, I said, nettled. Yes, we shall see. We had reached Listaway's cottage, and Poirot ushered me upstairs to his own room. He offered me one of the tiny Russian cigarettes he himself occasionally smoked. I was amused to notice that he stowed away the used matches most carefully in a little china pot. My momentary Annoyance vanished. 
Perot had placed our two chairs in front of the open window, which commanded a view of the village street. The fresh air blew in warm and pleasant. It was going to be a hot day. Suddenly, my attention was arrested by a weedy-looking young man rushing down the street at a great place. It was the expression on his face that was extraordinary, a curious mingling of terror and agitations. Look, Poirot, I cried. I said, he leaned forward. Tiens, he said, it is Mrs. M Mr. Mays from the chemist shop. He is coming here. The young man came to a halt before a leastways cottage, and, after hesitating a moment, pounded vigorously on the door. A little minute, cried Poirot from the window, I come, motion, motioning to me to follow him. He ran swiftly down the stairs and opened the door. Mr. Mace began at once. Oh, Mr. Poirot, I'm sorry for the inconvenience, but I heard that you just come back from the hall. Yes, we have. The young man moistened his dry lips. His face was working curiously. It's all over the village about old Mrs. Engelthorpe's dying so suddenly. They do say, he lowered his voice cautiously, that it's poison. Paru's face remained quite impassive. Only the doctors can tell us that, Mr. Mace. Yes, exactly, of course. The young man hesitated, and then his agitation was too much for him. He clutched Poirot by the arm and sunk his voice to a whisper. Just tell me this, Mr. Poirot. It isn't, it isn't, it isn't stricken. Is it? I hardly heard what Poirot replied. Something evidently of a non-committal nature. The young man departed, and as he closed the door, Poirot's eye met mine. Yes, he said, nodding gravely. He will have evidence to give at the inquest. We went slowly upstairs again. I was opening my lips when Poirot stopped me with a gesture of his hand. Not now, not now, mon ami. I have need of reflection. My mind in some disorder, which is not well. For about ten minutes, he sat in a dead silence, perfectly still except for several expressive motions of his eyebrows, and all the time his eyes grow steadily greener. At last, he heaved a deep sigh. It is well. The bad moment has passed. Now all is arranged and classified. One must never permit confusion. The case is not clear yet, no, for it is for the most complicated. It puzzles me. Me, Hercule Poirot, there are two facts of significance. And what are they? The first is the state of the weather yesterday. That is very important. But it was a glorious day, I interrupted. Poirot, you're pulling my leg. Not at all. The Terminator registered 80 in the shade. Do not forget that, my friend. It is a key to the whole riddle. And the second point, I asked, the most important fact that Monsieur Engelturf wears very peculiar clothes, has a black beard and uses glasses. Pearl, I cannot believe you are serious. I am absolutely serious, my friend. But this is childish. No, it is very momentous. And supporting the coroner's jury returns a verdict of willful murder against Alfred Engelturf. What becomes of your theories then? They would not be shaken because twelve stupid men had happened to make a mistake. But that will not occur. For one thing, a country jury is not anxious to take responsibility upon itself, and Mr. Engelturf stands practically in the position of local squire. Also, he added, lastly, 
I should not allow it. You would not allow it? No. I look at the extraordinary little man, divided between annoyance and amusement. He was so tremendously sure. Of himself, as though he read my thoughts, he nodded gently. Oh, yes, mon ami, I would do what I say. He got up and laid his hand on my shoulder. His physiognomy underwent a complete change. Tears came into his eyes. In all this, you see, I think of that poor Mrs. Inglethorpe, who is dead. She was not extravagantly loved, no, but she was very good to us Belgians. I owe her a debt. I endeavored to interrupt, but Perro whipped, swept on. Let me tell you this, Hastings. I would never forgive me if I let Alfred Engelter, her husband, be arrested. Now, when a word from me could save him. That was the end of chapter 5. And next time we're going to continue to chapter 6. So, thank you for watching and for reading with me. If you enjoyed this video, please like and leave a lovely comment. And if you really enjoyed it, please subscribe and click the notification bell. You will then be notified when I post a new video. I would like to thank you for all your emails, gifts, and tips. I love to read all your comments. Please keep it coming. For those who have bought me a coffee, thank you. If you want to buy me a coffee, the link is in the description below. If you want to message me directly, please send me an email at an.vanhofstada at gmail.com. The link is also in the description below. Please look at my other videos I had for The Persuasion by Jane Austen and The History of England by Jane Austen. Please tell your friends and family about this channel. Again, thank you so much for all your support. This channel would have not noticed or seen without your support. See you on my next video and goodbye.